Welcome. I look forward to spending the next 50 minutes or so with you, really thinking through uh, what the research has to say about the risks that graduate student therapists face uh, from all the traumatic material that they're exposed to and how we can work toward um, increasing resilience and kind of ameliorating those risks to some degree. My name's Shelley Welty. I'm the program director for the Trauma, Stress, and Resilience program at the Utah Center for Evidence-Based Treatment. I hope today, whether you're a graduate student yourself or a supervisor, mentor of a graduate student coming up in a career of social work or psychology, that you'll take something from today that um, will be helpful as we work together to help graduate students um, really become the most resilient possible. If you are able, if this is a recording that you're watching and you're able to take the ProQual before starting the presentation, I think that would be really uh, helpful to you. On the slide prior to this one, in the slideshow, there's a link that will lead you to that. It's the Professional Quality of Life Survey. And some of the terms that we're gonna to use today to talk about vicarious traumatization are measured in that um, survey. And so, you know, I think it's always most helpful if we have some personal application to material that we're uh, listening to, thinking about. And so if you take that ahead of time and know how you score in a few different areas, it may uh, help you uh, apply more of what you're learning as I talk. So as we think about uh, the direction for our time together today, my first uh, step is to define some of the concepts that we're gonna talk about today. And if you're like me, you're thinking, no, let's not go through all the definitions. But I think it's really important uh, because some of the terms that I'll be talking about are used interchangeably sometimes in the literature and at least for the next uh, hour or so that we have together, I'd like us to be on the same page about what those terms mean and um, the way that they interact in our understanding of vicarious traumatization. We'll look uh, at the challenges of graduate school students. Uh, these are specifically students in social work and all types of psychology programs and how exposure to traumatic material adds to those stressors for students. And then, you know, what we're really interested in is how can we reduce the negative effects of those stressors? Because those stressors are really kind of setting the, the landscape for your vulnerability. And we wanna know what can we do to reduce some of those uh, potential um, negative outcomes. And then I'll end by looking at some ways that you can begin to monitor yourself and kind of track where you are in different areas so that you can make changes away from uh, traumatization and toward resilience. So the first term, of course, that we wanna uh, think about is vicarious traumatization itself. This was a term that was uh, first used by McCann and Perlman in the early 1990s. And it refers to specifically helping professionals in the medical field, um, behavioral health fields, and refers to the negative changes that can happen in a therapist's uh, thoughts about themselves, others, and the world over the course of years of working uh, specifically with uh, traumatic uh, material in that they hear from their clients and experience with the presence of their clients. This really comes from a, a theoretical background that emphasizes that we will be affected by our clients, that there's um, really no question that in doing this work specifically with trauma, uh, we will be changed in some ways and Vicarious traumatization refers to those negative changes that can happen in therapists' outlook uh, if, if we don't 
kind of intentionally take steps to reduce that possibility. Happens kind of gradually over time. And um, so many of the terms that we're going to talk about next are elements that can increase uh, our level of vicarious traumatization. Secondary traumatic stress refers to symptoms that a therapist or helper, this really refers to helpers, not necessarily professionals, but anybody, a professional, a family member, a friend who's helping someone who's been traumatized. And that helper then begins to show some of the symptoms of PTSD, even though they haven't actually experienced a traumatic event. Um, the, the trauma that they're responding to is what they hear from uh, the person they're helping and even experience vicariously through the presence of this other person. This term is often, very often, uh, used in the research interchangeably with compassion fatigue, which was uh, introduced by Figley in the mid-1990s. Uh, secondary traumatic stress is a, a term that STAM uses later in the ProQual um, as a, an element of compassion fatigue. And we'll see that here in just a second. Burnout is a specifically work-related term. It refers to feelings of hopelessness, difficulty coping, frustration, uh, declining performance. Uh, these symptoms usually come gradually and they can be associated with a very high workload or a non-supportive work environment. That's not always the case. And um, this, kind of, this work can be either paid work or volunteer work. And so uh, I want to show you this diagram. This is from the manual for the ProQual actually, which uh, was written by Stam. And I think this is a nice diagram for us to begin to work with as we understand vicarious traumatization. Um, the one term here that we haven't talked about yet is compassion satisfaction. And that really just refers to the level of a feeling of reward from our work, the, the pleasantness that we experience as we do our work. And uh, we'll see that compassion satisfaction generally stays pretty uh, stable, even as someone may begin to feel some burnout and secondary traumatic stress. Uh, therapists often still find a great deal of satisfaction in their work. And as you'll see, as STAM continued to do work with the ProQual, um, the research showed that compassion fatigue was really could be broken down into these elements of burnout and secondary traumatic stress and so at least in terms of stam's work uh, compassion fatigue and sts are two separate um, concepts and i think this is a nice way of uh, keeping track of that so i'd like us to use this same diagram, same idea, to think about our work and uh, our own journey on this continuum of vicarious resilience, which I know we haven't talked about, but I'll talk about toward the end uh, of the pres presentation. But we want resilience. Uh, and at the other end, vicarious traumatization. So I've tweaked Stam's diagram just a little bit to emphasize some of the things we're going to talk about. That uh, vicarious traumatization really is a result of too much weight in compassion fatigue. And because compassion fatigue is composed of burnout and secondary traumatic stress, when our symptoms of burnout and or our symptoms of secondary traumatic stress go up, uh, our experience of compassion fatigue gets heavier. And that leans us further into vicarious traumatization. And as we uh, 
generally find in the research, our levels of compassion satisfaction may stay pretty stable, even as we're experiencing these really um, difficult symptoms of compassion fatigue and may make it even kind of confusing for therapists whether to continue what they're doing or to make some changes because they still find the work very rewarding. On the other hand, if we want to increase our vicarious resilience, we're gonna to wanna to do things that increase our compassion satisfaction even more, if possible, so that we're weighted in that direction. And at the same time, we're gonna to want to reduce burnout, symptoms of burnout, symptoms of STS as much as possible so that our experience of compassion fatigue doesn't tip us toward traumatization. So let's take a, a look. Um, all, all of the research listed at the bottom was done specifically on graduate students. And really that's what I set out to do today is look at uh, what the literature had to say uh, specifically about graduate students. So all of the studies I'll refer to today with the exception of one, and I'll point that one out when we get there, are done specifically on graduate student in social work and psychology programs uh, as the population that was studied. So I just wanted to take a second and look at the many challenges that researchers have found social work and psychology um, graduate students face. And these won't be surprising to you. You probably could sit down and make this list yourself. But I think that sometimes it's good to just step back and take a minute and just take stock of all that you are juggling in your lives as graduate students and how this uh, um, heavy load, constant demand, can put you at risk of um, lots of uh, difficulties actually, but primarily set you up to be more vulnerable to vicarious traumatization. Time demands are always at the top of the list. As a graduate student, there are always too many things to do and too little time. That's kind of a given. Um, Performance demands, you're always, you know, in the classroom, your clinical work, your research, someone is always evaluating you for many years. And that takes a toll on uh, your sometimes self-confidence or um, ability to just feel that you can be behave spontaneously. There are ethical challenges just in the work that you do that um, are just new. Even though you work with supervisors, you have some help with that. Uh, these are often new uh, challenges to think through for graduate students. And role switching, I'd like you to really think about the number of times that you have to change roles during the course of a day or a week, um, especially given that everything right now is done through video conferencing, the, the distance between those switches is very short. So you may do you may be a clinician for an hour or two at your practicum site and then within minutes switch over to your classroom and where you're a student and you take on a different uh, role then you may uh, move into some of your work for research and the different kinds of thinking that that demands of you you're also a friend um, uh, a child, you have parents that you relate to in some way, possibly a partner, and maybe you're a parent yourself. So you're constantly changing the way you think about things, the, the perspective that you think from, and that's very mentally demanding. Financial pressures are always an issue in graduate school. Self-doubt, anxiety, burnout, uh, lack of perceived support from supervisors came up frequently in the research. Students just wish they had more access, more time with uh, people who could really uh, help them navigate all these different uh, stressors in graduate school. 
Health issues can become uh, a concern and we'll look at some research on that as we talk. Uh, private, privacy concerns, in all of the different roles that you play, you're sharing a lot of personal information as you deal with um, all these different demands. And there can be times when you wonder what's being done with all of that information. And for some, depending on the stage of life you're in when you attend graduate school, uh, it may be that there, it is still part of that transition into independence, into adulthood. And depending on how smoothly uh, that transition has gone and what kind of support you've had throughout your life, that can be challenging in itself to navigate all of those um, new concerns while attending to everything in grad school. And El Garuri uh, in their research found that discrimination can be a real challenge for racial and ethnic minorities in graduate school. And I had really hoped as I uh, read through the literature that I'd be able to share with you uh, some of the diverse experiences of students. And uh, unfortunately that was not the case. Uh, most of the research, uh, most of the populations were primarily uh, female, white, um, with the exception of El Garuri's work. They did find some uh, specific uh, differences that were experienced by minority students. But if you're a graduate school student looking for some uh, a research topic, that would be a great one. There's not a lot of information uh, specifically in the field of social work and psychology in that area of diverse experiences. Um, El Garuri's group found that over 70% of students reported a stressor since beginning graduate work that kept them from functioning optimally. That's a large majority of the students. And 28% reported feeling so discouraged or hopeless that they weren't even trying to seek out resources for coping anymore. El Garuri had looked at um, only graduate students in all different um, psychology programs. I'm looking for my numbers. There were about almost 400 graduate students that this research group looked at. Butler's group looked at about 130 um, doctoral and master's psychology students and found that 42% of them reported a decline in health since beginning their program. 50% reported a decrease in efforts at self-care during the program. That's very concerning. 20% were high or severe on those secondary traumatic stress scores. And yet their compassion satisfaction scores were in the average to high range. And like I said, that's what we um, tend to find is that that stays pretty high. And I want to correct uh, Butler's group, actually, uh, I was thinking they were looking at almost 200 students in a graduate social work program. And we'll return to that study again later because they were looking specifically at a uh, curriculum that infused trauma content and also provided online self-care resources for students. And they really wanted to look at students' use of that and if that was helpful to them. So um, I want to look now at a, a study by Adams and Riggs, and they were the ones who looked uh, about 130 psychology graduate students. And I think this study is interesting. It gives us some ideas of uh, a place to start with changes that could be made to help protect you from vicarious traumatization. Um, this study was done partially um, out of in, an investigation um, into kind of the inconsistency in the research about whether a history of trauma 
contributes to vicarious traumatization in the therapist. So uh, the results on that have been inconsistent. And you can imagine there are just a lot of factors there. What type of trauma, uh, even if they did have a trauma history, what was that trauma? Has the therapist received uh, therapy for that? Uh, what kinds of things do they, uh, behaviors do they have in their lives to protect themselves from maybe the effects of a traumatic history? So it's a really difficult thing to pin down in one study. But Adams and Riggs uh, were uh, interested in looking at a couple different things. They wanted to look at the defense style of the clinician, graduate student clinician, as well as the amount of training that they'd had in trauma and also the uh, inter interaction of these. So as far as defense style, this is kind of generally understood on a continuum from what would be the most kind of reactive, uh, least developed defensive style where the therapist reacts uh, fairly impulsively, um, self-protective, and so there might be things such as numbing or dissociation or even some denial that that is what actually is happening to the client. And as you can imagine, this uh, does not contribute to good rapport with clients, would really get in the way of that. Kind of uh, about an intermediate style um, is kind of a self-sacrificing style where the therapist actually becomes overinvested in the client's behaviors. So they may, there may be some boundary violations by the therapist, um, just overinvestment in how the client makes decisions, maybe even some kind of controlling or overly directive uh, behavior on the therapist's part, just really wanting the client to make choices that seem best to the therapist. At the most uh, adaptive end of this continuum is a defensive style that is um, more where the therapist is more able to be separate from the client, allow the client to make their own decisions and pursue uh, healing in the, at the pace and in the way that they choose. So a therapist on this end of the continuum tends to be able to channel their desire for maybe advocating for change, can uh, find external organizations or ways to contribute to that, uh, able to use humor, be invested in things in their lives outside of their work, uh, better boundaries, so that they're able to let the client live separately from their own experience. So Adams and Riggs' work looked at um, what they knew about a therapist's defense style in addition to their trauma history, and then later also how much um, training they had in trauma. So what they found was that trainees that had that adaptive style, that most developed <clears throat> defensive style, which was about 42% of them, consistently reported the lowest levels of vicarious trauma symptoms. Then they even, uh, they divided that group into those with that adaptive defense style who had a trauma history and those who did not have a trauma history. And they found that the, they uh, were very similar uh, in their uh, symptoms of vicarious trauma. And so it seems that that adaptive defensive style has some kind of protective quality to it, uh, protects the therapist from becoming uh, traumatized. They found that over half of the sample had that self-sacrificing defense style, that kind of intermediate style, and these uh, student therapists had significantly higher levels of trauma symptoms than the adaptive style. And when they split those students into those with a trauma history and those without, they found that those who had a trauma history were the most, um, had the, the most symptoms. 
So <clears throat> um, really uh, what they, I, what they want, would want you to take from that is that if you, if you have this kind of intermediate style, and certainly if you have the, the least developed defensive style, it's very important that you get some feedback from supervisors about different ways of responding to clients, uh, especially traumatic material, in order to protect yourself uh, from being traumatized and also to um, in improve the rapport with the client to be able to be fully present with the client. This group also looked at the amount of uh, training in trauma that student therapists had had and the effect of that on their symptoms of vicarious traumatization. Uh, they found that 25% of the sample was working with trauma clients but had no formal training related to trauma at all. And they found that deficits in trauma-specific training were associated with increased vicarious trauma symptoms, and that was separate from their defensive style. So they were able to look at these two variables separately. Uh, then they thought, you know, like, what if, uh, what if it's a dose response sort of thing? Like a, a little bit of training in trauma maybe is better than nothing. Like maybe I, I came to this hour presentation on vicarious traumatization. Would that make a difference? And unfortunately they found that that was not the case that um, students who had no trauma training versus minimal, maybe a weekend workshop or half day workshop, uh, they found no differences between those. So what we take from, I think specifically that study is that it's very important that if you're working with traumatized clients, that you get really strong supervision about your countertransference issues, the way you respond to your clients, um, traumatic material, uh, helping you become more aware of your own defenses and how you might make changes in that, that would really uh, protect you and help you in your work. And out of that, it may become apparent that your own personal therapy might be really helpful uh, to help you understand why you respond in certain ways and to help you be more aware of how you are responding, where that comes from, and, and what needs to be done to make changes in that. It's also really important that you have semester-long courses on trauma or maybe a few intensive courses. Um, and I understand you don't have a lot of control over the curriculum a lot of times. Uh, but I, I encourage you to advocate for that. If your program doesn't have those, I, um, I hope that you as uh, student groups can work to change that. Um, but you really, if, if you want to pursue work in the field of trauma, you really need to pursue training as early in graduate school, as early in your career as possible. And so even though I know that may add to your stress of more time, possibly more money, uh, it's really important that you get that early in your career and begin working with that. Let's look at a few more studies. Um, I've put Craig and Sprang in here, and this is the one study that I'm using today that did not, um, didn't look at graduate students. This research group looked at about a little over four, a little over 500 psychologists and social, works, social workers who uh, self-identified as trauma specialists. And they found, and I think there are some important pieces here and why I've included this study. They found that burnout was related to younger age, a higher percentage of PTSD cases, working inpatient, and not using evidence-based practices. So, you know, you'll remember burnout is an element of compassion fatigue. So, uh, these are some things to keep in mind because we want the symptoms of burnout to be lower. 
They also found that compassion satisfaction was related to more years of experience and the use of evidence-based practices. So you'll see that one thing that these have in common is the use of evidence-based practices. It uh, reduced bur burnout and increased compassion satisfaction. And um, these researchers pointed out that a lot of times um, <clears throat> clinicians feel like evidence-based treatments are too manualized and uh, maybe get in the way of rapport with the client, but they um, propose that that maybe is not always the case. And particularly for uh, newer therapists, uh, more novice, especially trauma therapists, sometimes that structure might be very helpful to them as a place to start in working with trauma. And um, also just in building confidence, knowing that these are treatments that uh, have been shown to help clients with um, traumatic symptoms. Gottesman did look at graduate students uh, and found that a higher total number of hours providing trauma-focused therapy during practicum, and this is over the course of their graduate school experience, was a significant predictor of secondary traumatic stress symptoms. And again, STS symptoms are a component of compassion fatigue. So looking at those first two studies, Craig and Sprang and Gottesman, we see that a higher percentage of PTSD cases on the caseload or over the course of time um, can increase symptoms that lead to compassion fatigue. So it's important to begin really monitoring the number of traumatized clients you're seeing at one time or even within a fairly discrete period of time <clears throat> so that you can begin to learn uh, what is your capacity. And that may change over time. As a graduate student, probably your capacity is going to be lower as you're learning these evidence-based treatments, as you're learning about your own reactions to clients and how you can manage those and make changes to those. And um, really communicating well with your supervisor about your needs in this area. It may be that at, there are times when you need to um, not take more PTSD clients or um, maybe moving toward a break in that at some time during your practicum experience. I think it's also um, worth mentioning that uh, compassion satisfaction is related to more years of experience. And uh, as well as, you know, the, the uh, earlier comment that burnout was related to a younger age, um, that really over the course of time, as therapists commit to working in the field of trauma, uh, generally they're able to uh, integrate those experiences and find space within their worldview to manage all of that material that comes their way, that that actually improves over time. And we've seen, uh, research has shown that over the course of a trauma therapist's career, their symptoms of vicarious traumatization actually decrease. And McCann and Perlman, who coined the term vicarious traumatization, suggested that that may be because uh, therapists who can't manage traumatic material very well realize that pretty early in their career and go in a different direction. And or over the course of years, um, someone who persists in the work and keeps uh, tracking their own responses, learning how to manage their caseload, learning good ways of treatment, is more and more capable of uh, integrating these traumatic experiences that they're constantly exposed to within their worldview in a really uh, adaptable way. Uh, Butler's work, we saw earlier, this was done on social work graduate students, found that fieldwork stress was more related to re-traumatization than coursework stress. So uh, to elaborate on that a little bit, um, 
Butler's work found that students actually said that coursework was more stressful to them than their field work. Um, but on closer inspection, Butler's group found that it was the field work that actually contributed more to re-traumatization for those who had some kind of trauma history than the coursework stress. Um, Butler's group also found that fieldwork stress is correlated with burnout, higher rates of burnout, and uh, also increased uh, a decline. Um, fieldwork stress also contributed to a decline in health status by about 50%. So uh, even though students felt that coursework was more stressful than field work, uh, the actual outcomes show that the, the stress maybe is different in field work, but actually leads to some concerning outcomes for both health and um, mental health status. So I think looking at those studies, it's important to come away with a few things that um, it's really important as uh, a newer clinician to learn and use evidence-based treatments when working with traumatized clients. Uh, this can really help you begin to understand more about uh, the dynamics of trauma, uh, how to target uh, specific interventions for specific um, presentations, um, can provide you more confidence and uh, a direction to go in your treatment. And it's also really important that you be proactive about limiting the number of clients who uh, are dealing with traumatic material on your caseload at one time and even over the course of your time in graduate school. And I think even as you uh, work with your supervisors, being really uh, um, open with them about your desire to learn these types of treatments and to, to learn to monitor your own capacity at any one time so that as you advance in your career, and it may be that you're able to most likely take on more and more uh, clients who have PTSD, uh, you'll know how to, how you'll, you'll be more aware of yourself and when it's time to back off and when you're able to take on more. So I've referred to supervision a bit, and I want to just take a minute to review a few things that could be helpful in supervision. Um, I've already mentioned the importance of learning about trauma. That could be learning about the therapist's uh, re reactions to clients' trauma material. It could be understanding the dynamics of trauma, um, even the, the bigger cultural issues at play in victims of trauma, um, and just how to manage one's countertransference reactions. Uh, the research also shows that it's really the quality of supervision that is most protective against secondary traumatic stress rather than the quantity. Students really um, want supervisors who are invested who can provide them really helpful material, help them to understand themselves better, rather than just having a lot of supervision. And El Garuri's work found that ethnic and racial minorities sought out supervision uh, more often than did their white counterparts, really valued this as a way of managing some of the stress of graduate school. And I think as mentors and supervisors, um, it's important for us to find ways to make that more available to more of our students who can uh, really benefit from that support. And I've added the National Child Traumatic Stress Network Secondary Traumatic Stress Core Competencies. I think it's just good as supervisors, you know, for us to take stock once in a while and just have um, a place to check in and say, uh, what are some of the things that my supervisees really need from me? 
how am I doing on that? Are there things we maybe need to address that I uh, hadn't thought of? Um, ways that I could consider linking up my supervisee with more resources. So that's, that's available for you to check out on your own. And I'm gonna take just a second to talk about self-care. And uh, I know from the research that graduate students are tired of hearing about self-care. And that's really because they hear a lot of talk about self-care, but then uh, there isn't actually the time to invest in self-care that's needed. And so they're frustrated with all this talk of how they should take care of themselves when it's not actually possible to do so. So I'm just going to leave this one tip, social support, social support, social support. That is always the number one self-care route. And that needs to be lots of diverse types of support. Could be professors, family, friends, uh, people in your cohort. <clears throat> Diversify your support and prioritize it. That's one thing you should not give up as you make your journey through graduate school. Butler's work, you know, uh, if you remember, this was a social work graduate program, trauma-infused curriculum, and they had online self-care resources available to students. And they wanted to see uh, if having those resources available affected students' use of self-care resources. So they started by just asking, how important do you think self-care is? And um, there was no argument. You know, all, all but 1% said it was at least moderately important. So um, that's a good starting point. And then they asked students uh, how much effort, what the change in effort was after they started the program. So about a quarter of them said they had increased their self-care effort since starting graduate school. Another quarter said they really hadn't changed it. So we don't know what it was to begin with, but whatever it was, they didn't change it. And half of the students decreased their self-care. Um, those who decreased their self-care effort had higher rates of burnout and secondary traumatic stress scores. So I would hypothesize that these are probably students who prior to graduate school knew just the amount of self-care they needed to stay in a pretty stable place. Started graduate school, the stressors increase a great deal and the um, self-care dropped. So that had a pretty, um, negative effect on them. Those who increased their self-care efforts showed higher compassion satisfaction scores and reduced the odds of a decline in health status by two thirds. So the takeaway here is don't decrease your self-care efforts after you start graduate school. You probably know at least the minimum that you need to uh, keep yourself healthy and um, in a good place emotionally. So if you don't increase it, at least don't decrease it um, because we see that there are pretty negative effects to that. So one of the things that I'm, uh, I'm really excited, uh, probably the most of, of all the things I've talked about, about the idea of vicarious resilience. And this is actually uh, what I'm gonna talk about it, uh, in regards to this. Uh, this research was not done with graduate students. I'm, uh, pulling this in as a direction that I think would be really helpful for you as an early career professional to really in, begin to incorporate into your life. This is a fairly new body of research. Um, the studies at the bottom, those are the primary researchers in this area. And their work has been almost exclusively done in international settings with uh, victims of torture and refugees. And the idea of vicarious resilience is really comes from very much the same uh, theoretical underpinning as vicarious traumatization. Just the idea that we will be affected by the clients that we work with. There's no way that we can engage in this work without 
being changed in some way, either positively or negatively. And vicarious resilience is uh, what these researchers have found in therapists who continue to work with these very traumatized populations. Uh, that these therapists report that their own level of resilience has grown through their interaction with their clients. They have observed in these people who have uh, continued to um, move forward in life, to have hope, to continue to um, move in a positive direction even after really difficult uh, traumatic events in their lives. And seeing that resilience in their clients has actually um, created change in the therapist. And they reported behavioral changes, sometimes spiritual changes, changes in the way that they think about the world. Um, these uh, elements of vicarious resilience um, really have a lot to do with our own examination of our multiple identities, uh, the systems in the world that contribute to the existence of traumatic events, um, what role we as therapists in our lives may play in perpetuating um, violence and abuse. And so it requires a lot of introspection. In uh, this 2018 review of the literature, Hernandez Wolf looked at the elements that were found in all the research up to that point on vicarious resilience. And these were the, um, the common elements that were found among therapists working with these um, very traumatized populations. And I'll let you uh, look through that list on your own, on your own time, but these elements were uh, used then to create the vicarious resilience scale. And I've added this slide by Hernandez um, early in the vicarious resilience work because uh, this was um, really this article was proposed as a supervision or training exercise. Uh, self-reflection questions that students could ask of themselves as they work with traumatized populations. Um, these questions I think are really good for you to come back to over time, maybe when you're working with a, a difficult case or uh, over the course of time for you to check in on your own, hopefully growing resilience as you maybe check in uh, on your symptoms of vicarious traumatization, also checking, are you growing in your resilience? Is your work with clients helping you to become a more resilient person? And that really, uh, they found that it's really therapists who are very strengths-based in their work, who are especially mindful of the ways that their clients are um, using their strengths, are continuing to hope, are moving forward with intention, and noticing that in our clients uh, can help us to incorporate pieces of resilience in ourselves, even as we are helping them in many ways. So I encourage you to come back to this over time, to talk about it with your supervisor, maybe uh, with some of your peers, to just monitor your own growth in this way. And so some things I hope you will take away today. The ProQual, which I mentioned at the beginning, can help you monitor your levels of burnout, secondary traumatic stress, and compassion satisfaction. So I suggest uh, you, you can take it today, if you haven't already, to see where you are uh, in those different areas. And we've talked about each of those areas in some ways that you can reduce those symptoms. Um, and increase compassion satisfaction. I encourage you to do that on a regular basis because sometimes um, we're so involved in the work that we're not noticing maybe some of the negative effects that it has begun to have on us. I also encourage you to use that vicarious resilience training, uh, those questions 
to regularly reflect on your work and to do that intentionally uh, with supervisors and mentors as well as your peers. And from everything we've talked about, just remembering what we learned uh, can be very helpful. Making sure that you get high quality supervision. So if you want to work in the field of trauma and you're looking at different sites where you could do your work, it would be important that you um, get some feedback from that site about uh, how, how regular is supervision, um, what will it focus on, will you get training specifically in trauma work or in evidence-based practices. And you may want to seek out your own personal therapy um, just to be very aware of your own responses to clients because we know that um, learning to have a more adaptive defensive style, reacting, um, allowing your clients to, to be their own people and you having many channels for um, investing in your own life and advocating for people outside of therapy can be really protective of you. It's important that you have in-depth training on trauma and this can be in the classroom or you may have to pursue some of that on your own. Make sure that your field work, if you're doing trauma work, that it's grounded in evidence-based practices for PTSD. Uh, this is gonna give you a really strong foundation for future work in trauma and give you some added confidence as you begin this work. Really begin to monitor and limit appropriately the number of PTSD cases that are on your caseload at one time and over the course of you know, a fairly short period of time. And really uh, imagining this, understanding this as a growing awareness, feeling, you know, how do you feel when things, when you have too many trauma cases on your caseload and learning to uh, be able to respond to that uh, more quickly and to care for yourself more intentionally those times. Sustain or increase your self-care efforts, don't decrease them. And prioritize social support. So I hope that even if you just take one thing from today that you can uh, add to the way that you're approaching this work, um, I would be really happy with that. There are a couple slides uh, as you go on here that list all of the different studies that we've looked at today that'll be available to you. And um, Really appreciate you tuning in today, and I wish you the very best.